at stanza six. So he whispers the word Lenore out into the darkness and hears it back in an echo. Echoes themselves are uncanny, as Freud explains in his essay. Um, but he doesn't get anything more, so he turns back into the chamber and again starts to rationalise to himself. So clearly there are rational explanations for the tapping and so forth. So he speaks aloud to himself and tries to rationalise. He says, surely there is something in my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat it is and this mystery explore. And he repeats, and this mystery explore. So he tries to turn it into a detective story that he's going to sort of uncover. But then he says, tis the wind and nothing more. So he's still trying to reassure himself and for us, the, the readers, the audience, that gives us a sense, again, of foreshadowing. There's something more than just the wind is going to occur. So then, in stanza seven, the raven comes in and perches on a bust of Pallas. So Athena, Greek goddess of wisdom, as our notes carefully tell us. And this immediately introduces a disparity in the poem between real life and how our speaker interprets real life. I mean, we don't know what actually happened as a poem, it's made up, but intrinsically, if we're suspending our disbelief, we can imagine a raven coming into um, a room. The, uh, the French philosopher Hélène Sixou has an amazing essay where she just talks about um, rescuing a bird she thinks is dead and then it wakes up in the room and flies around and it terrifies her and her daughter. Um, so this idea of birds kind of coming to life or coming into our places of residence is pretty normal. Um, and then the bird just perches on a bust up on the wall, which again isn't unreasonable, birds like to perch up high. But immediately the speaker interprets what's happening, perching on a bust of Pallas. The raven doesn't know it's a bust of Pallas. The raven doesn't know what a bust is. The raven's just perching up high. But the speaker immediately interprets it as actively perching on something deliberately, the bust of the Greek goddess of wisdom. So immediately the speaker is being drawn into the notion that the raven might have something important to say, some wisdom to impart. And then the speaker amusedly addresses the raven. So this is stanza eight. Um, Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. So this is the one word the raven speaks all poem, nevermore. And the theme of darkness that I've already been talking about is made explicit here with this phrase, the night's Plutonian shore. So Pluto is the god of the dead. So that link between darkness and death is made explicit here. Um, and our speaker is making the link, right? He says, um, what's your name on the night's Plutonian shore? What's your name out there in the night? And the raven responds with nevermore. Um, and the speaker in the next stanza immediately identifies that this is a non sequitur, that if you ask someone their name and they say nevermore, nevermore isn't a name. So the speaker says, um, much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. So he's admiring the bird's ability to speak, but he identifies that the answer to the question, little relevancy bore, it's not relevant. So intrinsically he knows the bird isn't answering the question, so he's still being successful in rationalising the events that are happening, but we've already got hints that that rationalising can only last for so long because he's already identified, probably unconsciously, the connection between the raven and Pluto, death, and Pallas, wisdom. So for him the raven isn't just a bird, 
Whatever the raven has to say, it has power. I think I'm going to skip the next stanza. It's not that significant. Um, because the speaker keeps rationalizing. So uh, in line 61, startled at the stillness broken by reply, so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master. So he's rationalizing what's happening. This is the only word the bird can say. He's picked it up from some unhappy master. The master said never more a lot, and the raven has picked it up. And the speaker then sinks into his chair and starts to think about what all this might mean. Line 73. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press, ah, nevermore. So he's back to thinking about his lost love, Lenore. I'm assuming it's his lost romantic love, but we don't know for sure. Poe has this um, history in his horror stories of talking about forbidden love between siblings, for instance. Um, and then we get to the, the, the next very significant change in the poem. So this is line 79. Then methought the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. This idea of the air growing denser, it again speaks to this sort of otherworldliness, that if the air grows denser, that means something uncanny, something um, divine or devilish is happening. Perfume from an unseen sensor. So the very smell of the air is changing for no apparent reason, and that lack of apparent reason is what is uncanny. Um, and so he shouts out and he says, um, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost Lenore. So he might be talking to the raven here, he might be calling the raven the wretch, but he might also be talking to himself, right? He's extolling himself to drink this drug, Nepenthe, that will help him to forget. He's extolling himself to forget Lenore, forget his pain, and then the raven says, nevermore. So here, now, the speaker is starting to lose his ability to rationalise away what the raven is saying. The raven has said exactly the same word, but the context has changed. The speaker is called for, you know, the power to forget his sadness and suffering, and the raven says nevermore, i.e. you're not going to be able to forget. So then, now for sure, the speaker calls out to the raven and says, you're a thing of evil, you're a prophet. Um, but despite calling the raven this thing of evil, this tempter, he can't stop himself asking a question, because even if the raven is devilish, that means the raven has access to hidden knowledge, and more than anything, the speaker wants knowledge of what happened to his love. So he says, tell me truly, this is line 88, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. So balm is, you know, a healing ointment. So he's asking about, is there hope for healing? Is there an afterlife? He wants to find out if his love is in heaven. And the raven says, nevermore, again. So here the raven is either saying he's not going to tell the speaker whether there's balm in Gilead, or he's saying that there isn't balm in Gilead. But either way, it's bad. So the speaker says, 
Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, 